Hello, everybody, and welcome to another detailed diatribe where I am joined by Red. What's up? We're breaking the mold with this one. Superheroes, but not Superman? Is that allowed? <laughs> there are other ones? I thought there was only the guy. Oh, well, you know, at least he's still red and blue color-coded, so I don't need to get too far out of my comfort zone. Oh, f <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, no! <laughs> the symbiote has the opportunity to do something hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we are here talking about uh, a Marvel superhero, the best Marvel superhero, Spider-Man, and the best <laughs> Marvel superhero story, which is the symbiote, mm. Spider-Man's perfect flaw. I wanted to do a version of this detailed diatribe since we first came up with the idea like two years ago, <laughs> and only in the, the context of, of the reason we're doing it right now did I realize, yes, the, the time has arrived, so I'm very excited to talk about this today. I can tell it was a passion project because you made sure to include marble in the background just to really show that it was it had that <laughs> personal touch. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So I care about this a lot because I am uh, a fiend <laughs> for Spider-Man. Uncontrollably so. This is a photograph of me <laughs> on the launch day for 2018's Sony's Marvel's Insomniac Spider-Man. And I have never dressed up for a video game launch before, and I probably never will again mm. uh, until the launch of Spider-Man 2, but we'll get to that in a second. I, I called my mom and dad to ask for quotes about what my interest in Spider-Man was like as a child. And my dad said that my interest taught him something new about how extreme interest can be, <laughs> which is very diplomatic. Oh, man. And my mom said that, uh, oh, my God, I have 100 pictures of you in your Spider-Man costume. You went everywhere in that costume. That was your confidence. The whole hero thing was so poignant for you. It was your whole childhood. The books, the games, everything. That's passion. So Damn. I was... I was in for Spidey. <laughs> I was all on board with it. And then I just happens to have a Spider-Man onesie for the exact purpose of wearing it, playing it on launch day when the Spider-Man game came out. I love that. So very, very exciting. Like, we never pretend to be objective commenters on anything we retell. We never claim to be, like, scholarly and sterile in our opinions. But I, I really appreciate you going right out the gate doing the exact opposite of that. Hello, I am the most <laughs> biased presenter you could possibly have. Spider-Man is my sh**. And here is why it's going to be your problem for the next half hour to two and a half hours. <laughs> Here's my whole ass. Let's go. <laughs> oh, Exactly. So the reason that we're doing this right now is because we got a new video game coming out. It's coming. That is Sony's Marvel's Insomniac's <laughs> Spider-Man 2. <laughs> 2. Is this all... Because, of course, when, when the first Spider-Man game came out, that was <laughs> long, so I was like, oh, yeah, Spider-Man PS4. Is this new one Spider-Man PS5? It's Spider-Man PS5. Perfect. Yeah. It's great. Already exactly. maximize efficiency. <laughs> yes. So uh, the, the main storyline that they're doing in this new game is the symbiote uh, and, of course, Venom coming along with it. So I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight why the symbiote storyline is the best Spider-Man archetype of a story that exists in any of his media. <laughs> because goddamn, when I saw that they were doing this, I was so excited. Even when I finished the first game and I'm like, oh, they're teasing Venom. Oh, oh yeah, here we go. This is great. I was I was super jazzed. So oh, this yeah. is uh, very exciting for me. And in anticipation of this game, or uh, once this game's already come out after time of recording, if you want to have a primer before you go in, or you just played it and you want to see what other symbiote stuff there is, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> so yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, I feel like the, the black suit Spider-Man arc is like one of the iconic things that every adaptation has to hit at least once in the same way that like when they started assembling the Avengers, they were like, okay, when are we going to do Ultron? When are we going to do Thanos? When are we going to do Secret Invasion? Like the, the big hitters yep. from the comics. And for Spider-Man, it's, it's basically... It's basically the black suit. Like, other stuff does have, yeah. like, black suit and Gwen Stacy bites it. Like, those are the two things. Yeah. And Spider-Man lifts the heavy thing. Those Spider are, like, yeah. the three stuffs that's got to happen to him. You are so right. Black suit Spider-Man, Gwen Stacy breaks her neck, Spider-Man lifts the heavy thing. Exactly. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> the three genders? Yeah. <laughs> At last. But it, it wasn't always intended as that. Originally, uh, debuting in 1984, the black suit was created for the Secret Wars storyline. Peter's original costume gets all screwed up, so he goes to a fancy machine and does some comic book BS to spin out a new black ball of goop that, like, grabs onto him and transforms into his new suit. And this was just intended to be a redesign. Like, here you go, here's Spider-Man's new new outfit. Comic book characters got that a lot. Yeah. Uh, when their their personas were not quite as, as rigid uh, as, as we think of them now. 
Uh, there's a little bit of, like, wackiness with, with when the issues were released, because uh, Secret Wars is the origin story for this black suit, and it came out in December of 1984, but the first printed publication was from, like, May of 1984 with Amazing Spider-Man 252, which is when it first showed up, and it was a whole, it was, like, a different thing, so he had the suit, and then, like, later that year, we got the origin story for the suit, uh, eh? but, like, 1984 is when it started, wow. <laughs> fundamentally. This is literally 1984. The, what? I mean, it must have been because drawing those spider webs on his costume was a pain in the ass, right? Like, this is, like, a notorious thing known about superhero costumes costumes, if they have any sort of, like, patterning that needs to be drawn over and over again every panel, it's going to be a pain in the butt. And they're like, I got it. We're going to sandblast him. <laughs> We're going to smooth him up. Going to drop him in tar. Yeah, it was, um, there was a lot of weird responses to the black suit internally and externally. Uh, in the fan community, it was a huge controversy, so the the first comic run printed with, the rumors are true, Spider-Man's got a new black suit. Because, like, it was it was out in the community. They're like, oh, they're, they're gonna do this black suit thing. But uh, Todd McFarlane also hated drawing the black suit, so huh. he's like, I'll do this run. But you got to get rid of it, so the, we'll we'll see how that how that plays out metatextually as well. But uh, he's got a new black suit. It's super exciting. But things aren't all eyeliner and MCR because the suit causes some trouble. I was like, what's the opposite of sunshine and rainbows? Eyeliner and MCR. Perfect. Uh, in Amazing Spider-Man 258, the symbiote takes Peter on a joyride around the city. Uh, he wakes up very tired and very confused, and only realizes afterwards, like, oh. I did stuff at night, completely unaware of it because I was fully asleep, but the symbiote was just riding my poor superhuman ass around town. <laughs> That's uncomfy to think about. Mm -hmm. I feel tired and stressed and kind of icky about that. And at first he's like, oh man, like I, I feel so worn down, like ah, being Spidey's tough. And then he's like, oh no, it, it, it did that to me. Oh, uh, ugh, okay. Yeah. I, it did just occur to me, uh, the trading in the spiderweb pattern for the black suit produces a completely different artistic problem, which is that uh, anytime he overlaps with himself, like he puts his arm in front of himself or whatever, they need to do some serious shading tricks to distinguish the black of his suit from the black of the suit yeah. behind it. That would be a huge pain in the butt. So they're both problems, but they're different problems. <laughs> they're, they're, they're differently problems. Yes. Yeah. We later learn that uh, after he takes us to Reed Richards to figure out what the hell is this, Reed is like, this is an alien. Spidey's like, quack. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that's where we get the, the backstory of this being a symbiote life form that takes the shape of the suit and bonds with Spider-Man and all the, the the various backstory that spins out in comic book land of like this this whole society of symbiotes and mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not important and it doesn't matter and it's comic booky and it's basically not touched almost at all for the next like 30 years of symbiote storylines oh, in, the... in the mainstream versions of media. You're going to be hearing from the Lethal Protector fans about that one. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but yeah. in, in in the more mainline stories uh, in like TV, movies and stuff, we just, it's 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 from space. And we'll see where that version of it comes from. So Spider-Man has all these extra powers. This is great. But he's, he's starting to feel uncomfortable with the idea of this alien on him. So he eventually gets rid of it, knocks it off with the power of, of uh, sonic blasts in the form of, of bells. Big bell. And big bells. <laughs> <laughs> big bell. Then the symbiote, having been been pretty peeved off by, by Spider-Man's rejection of him, bonds with Eddie Brock and creates Venom, and then that becomes a whole separate archetype of, of the Venom storyline and, and stuff that spins off. We're not really going to talk too much about that, but mm -hmm. this is the, the first core run of the symbiote story where um, they, they brought it in. People were like, yeah, I'm not really a fan of this. Todd McFarlane really did not did not like drawing it this way. But over time, over the course of this run of, of, of a handful of issues, people started to kind of turn around to it. They were like, oh, this, this is fun. Delicious edge. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of on board with it. Yeah, we, we always know that the fans are always so accepting of Black Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So the, the fans were eventually turning around to this uh, because the, the delicious edge cannot be resisted for long. Of course. But the comic book creators were still on board with like, we're going to get rid of this thing, you know, we, the bells and all that stuff. So whereas this could have been a permanent change to Spider-Man's, you know, backstory and look and feel, which is what happened to a lot of other characters where they just get redesigns over time. It's like, that's their new design. Yeah. This then became a story arc where he gets the suit, 
lives with it for a little while and then gets rid of it and then that becomes a Venom origin story. Because they didn't make it a permanent part of his canon, it was basically like lifted out into a distinct story chunk that then becomes like a perfect little bite-sized story archetype that you can then use in any other iteration of Spider-Man that you do later on. So because of this kind of weird relation where people didn't like it at first, and then they liked the suit later, but they still decided to get rid of it, and the fans were like, oh, well, this is actually pretty cool. They were willing to have it be brought back. So it has this very interesting space in the story where there's this knock-on effect that because it, it wasn't a permanent change, it took the form of a, a unit of story, a pre-built arc. So you get, you know, Spider-Man lifts the heavy thing, the Gwen Stacy death, and then of course this. So <laughs> this takes the form that we best know later on, about 10 years later, with the 1994 animated Spider-Man cartoon, oh. which is the one that I grew up on. Not the 1967 where he's doing the pointing <laughs> meme, the, uh, the animated series, which I think a lot of us grew up on. That, that was really a, was a pretty infectious. foundational. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good, classic gift. A pretty foundational uh, cartoon for, for us millennial Spider-Man fans. But the Venom Saga here gives us essentially the quintessential interpretation of the symbiote storyline with all of the beats that we recognize. So originally we had like the Secret Wars thing and a bunch of other different kind of aspects of the story that aren't easy to adapt into a story where Spider-Man's kind of the only character. I mean, you can't... Mm. How do you do the symbiote without Secret Wars? Turns out actually very easily. Yeah. And it turned out into a really surprisingly good three-parter to watch back uh, over time. I was genuinely not expecting to like this as much as I did. I thought, okay, you know, 90s Spider-Man cartoon. It was it was good when I was young, but uh, my tastes have, have maybe improved a little bit. Maybe I'm going to be like, oh, this is actually kind of lame. No, it's still good as hell. Oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> we found your reboot. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> this, is, this is finally reboot for him. <laughs> yeah. So th this is a, a verified Ovid moment where it's like, okay, this is the version of the story that we're stuck with. Whatever we were doing in the comics, forget about it. Nonsense, forget we don't need it. it. As, as mentioned, they absolutely nailed it in one. It's frankly shocking how many things they changed in this story in very effective ways to create what is fundamentally the perfect archetypical symbiote story within a larger Spider-Man narrative. So they make a couple key changes to simplify things down in a way that works for the story. The symbiote comes from space via astronaut John Jameson, so we don't need to do our Secret Wars nonsense. It's just like, hey, they're on an asteroid, and the astronaut gets a rock, and it's gloopy, and he takes it back, and then it's on Earth. This involves a shuttle crash on the George Washington Bridge, which is honestly a pretty spectacular sequence to watch play out huh. in an animated cartoon. I'm like, they had the budget for this? Damn. <laughs> what they also do with this is when the spaceship crashes, Spider-Man, you know, saves the astronauts. Oh, amazing. Eddie Brock is on the bridge, you know, another, like, freelance uh, journalist and photographer, mm -hmm. and he snaps pictures of what's happening. What really happens is that Rhino is tasked by Kingpin to steal the, the black rock. It's called Prometheum X. Ooh. This whole thing is like a super material that can do a whole bunch of edgy 90s cartoon nonsense. Um, Transformium. And he does that, and Spider-Man's busy saving the astronauts and, like, stopping everyone from exploding in this, like, rocket crash. Of course. But what Eddie Brock does is he takes these pictures and then basically, like, kind of, like, early photoshops it together to create this conspiracy where Spider-Man crashed the ship and then stole the rock and booked it and, like, left these astronauts for dead. So Jameson puts a million-dollar bounty on Spider-Man's head. Jesus. Which is absolutely insane. Jameson had a million dollars? Apparently, and that's in 1994 money, so that that's, uh, that's something. The way that Peter gets the uh, the symbiote is that he gets it uh, in the crash, he, he falls in the, the Hudson after the, the whole thing happens, and as he walks out to the shore, he has this black goop on him, he's like, ugh, Hudson River pollution, rich, <laughs> thick, and creamy. I'm like, oh, oh Peter, Peter, why no. would you say that? <laughs> yeah. So we have this, this aspect of, like, Eddie Brock being this antagonist character to Spider-Man by besmirching his name, but also to Peter by being a rival photographer at the, the Bugle. That, mm. that kind of gets Peter into trouble as well. So this is uh, a little bit of the, the Venom origin being planted in a clever way. And additionally, once Spider-Man gets the suit, it makes him significantly stronger, but also much angrier. 
Originally, in the first comic run, the suit doesn't make him, like, angry or irritable. It just, like, wears him out in ways that he doesn't like and takes his body on joyrides, but it doesn't, like, negatively affect his personality or his relationships. Mm. This, this animated run really leans into that aspect of the story. So he has a bunch of extra powers. He can just shoot webs on his own without the mechanical web shooters. The suit just does it on its own. The suit can transform into different disguises, so when he's being hunted by the police because of this million-dollar bounty, He's, like, in this this busy street uh, area, and he, like, hides around a corner for a second, and then the symbiote suit transforms into a police uniform, and he's like, they went that way! Whoa. So Spider-Man's already practicing the art of deception. Damn. Uh, and this is not a power that usually happens with the symbiote suit, but it was cool that they were like, yeah, what else can we give him that that, that seems cool and, and exciting, so... Yeah. Uh, later on, he starts, like, transforming his outfit into, like, cool Italian suits when he's going to school to, like... <laughs> flirt on Felicia Hardy and, and try to uh, piss off um, Flash Thompson. Oh, he's so high school. For real, this is honestly a really solid hour of cartoon that I genuinely was not expecting to have. <laughs> they do a lot of cool stuff with, you know, like solidifying the symbiote story and condensing it and, and drawing out aspects of it to make it more compelling, like having it negatively affect Peter's emotions. But when he's first bonding with it, he has this really intricate, like, dream chase sequence where he's running around this city in this giant, like, symbiote black cloud loud is chasing after him but then there's this like spider-man suit with like really wibbly kind of dreamlike proportions then they're like fighting over him and like pulling him back and forth and it's it's genuinely pretty cool to see huh. to have this like battle of the center in the mind as he's first getting the suit and then when he comes to he's hanging off the side of a skyscraper from that that slide earlier mm. and he's like oh whoa what's this so it, it's genuinely really well done like i was not expecting it to be as as, as well paced as it was when the, the Spider-Man cartoon caliber we'd been used to before was the, the pointing meme <laughs> and all those dumb gifts. <laughs> he's, he's stronger, he's faster, he's much bolder. He starts to get cocky and arrogant in ways that, you know, this Peter never really has been before. So when he's like, you know, mouthing off to Flash Thompson, Felicia says that his new attitude scares her and Peter's like, yeah, whatever, man. <laughs> But that, that kind of sticks in the back of his head. His relationships are already kind of starting to suffer a little bit. And then he straight up starts acting malicious. So as he's in his business of fighting crime and trying to track down this whole conspiracy with, like, what's going on and who actually tried to steal the, uh, the Prometheum X, he starts fighting Rhino and throws him around like an action figure and is about to fully murder him by dropping a steel door on his face. Yeesh. Except at one point, he's... Rhino is like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> and then Spider-Man kind of flashes back to Felicia saying, you're scaring me, Peter. And he's like, uh-oh, this is bad. So he like throws the door to the side, runs away, just flees. And Rhino's like, oh, what was that about? Uh, and, and before this, he says, I give up trying to be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man when he's about to absolutely flatten <laughs> Rhino. <laughs> Oh, so the man is clearly off his rocker a little bit. I, I like that Rhino's like, you know, I, I'm down for violent crime, but I draw the line at uh, superheroes murdering people. That's pretty <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> it's like I didn't think the leopards would eat my face <laughs> kind of situation. But oh, boy. yeah, in, in the next episode, he goes to confront Jameson about the bounty as, you know, having evidence of like, oh, this is fake. I didn't steal this. Rhino stole this. And then he's about to literally kill Jameson until some guards burst in and stop him. So it's, it, it's pretty intense. Spider-Man starts acting straight up awful uh, in this cartoon yikes and then uh his suit kind of goes on kill mode cruise control <laughs> so at one point he's fighting some goons and he uh like he breaks a, a fire hydrant and gets a bunch of water on their equipment and he's like ha now that i've splashed water on your equipment it's all gonna explode and then he swings away <laughs> <laughs> he just leaves these people to die. The Good man's luck. going nuts. <laughs> so he he keeps on just committing horribly senseless acts of unforgivable violence, even when he acknowledges, hey, I think I'm out of line. He cannot stop himself. He, he His edgelord self is completely in control. And even when he's going to do something noble, which is to save uh, John Jameson from a, a whole hostage scenario, he's just reveling in and acting violence on Shocker in the process of this fight in a way that, like, usually Spider-Man's like, he's quipping, he's having fun. Like, no, he wants to break this man's bones. Yeesh. It's kind of nuts. But it also takes us to the absolutely legendary line read when he, when Shocker's just running away. He's like, I'm out of here, man. This is insane. And Spider-Man says, Shocker! You can't escape me! I'll chase you to the ends of the earth! It's amazing! It's so dark. It's the hardest line read that this actor has ever given for the entire show. God. And it comes out of not really, like, nowhere because he's had the whole episode to build up, but it is... 
It's 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 a big jump. It's a lot when you actually watch that episode back. That's like same energy as I think it's the ocean dub Dragon Ball Z thing where Vegeta's like, you will escape my wrath! <laughs> Everyone's like, wow, why did this yeah. suddenly go way too hard? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's wild. This this Spider Man is, is is a bad dude. <laughs> he he's having this situation where um he's about to like throw Shocker off the edge of this bell tower, and Shocker's like, yeah, you you can't kill me. And Spider Man says, why not? I have the power, <laughs> and he's about to kill this man. And then he has a flashback to Uncle Ben and the great power, great responsibility. And he's like, oh my God, I'm I'm crossing a line. I'm gonna do something unforgivable. I'm gonna have my 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 worst '80s self take over. And then. As he's in this moment of hesitation, the symbiote suit reaches out from Spider-Man's chest and just pushes Shocker off the bell tower anyway. <laughs> it's like, you are taking too much time, I'm taking matters into my own hand, Boom, <laughs> gone. <laughs> it just knocks him off and eventually Spider-Man like saves him, he comes to and he's like, oh my god, this is insane. So he like webs him up, saves him from falling, and then Spider-Man realizes, okay, the the suit's canceled. This this has to stop. I gotta get out of here, man. Symbiote is over party. <laughs> yeah. So he's trying to rip it off, and it's not working, but then the bell in this tower goes off, and then once again we have, like, the symbiote hate sounds. It's really an audiophile. It has very specific tastes and sound quality, and the acoustics in this tower are just completely not it's it. It's not even on vinyl! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, Spider-Man gets the suit off, and then as it's, like, falling off of him, it drops down onto Eddie Brock, who is also there for other reasons, longer story. And then this, of course, creates Venom. And yeah. then the next episode, the final in the three-parter, is the Venom episode, which I have to say, as much as I was saying, like, this, these last two episodes were, were genuinely very good for, you know, 90s cartoon. I was not expecting that level of quality. This Venom episode absolutely slaps. The whole, like, 20 minutes is basically an extended chase sequence where Venom is just on Spider-Man's ass the whole time. <laughs> At first, it's Shocker and Rhino teaming up on Spider-Man, and he almost gets completely, like, wailed by these two, but then Venom intervenes, and Spider-Man doesn't see it coming because of how the symbiote works. Yeah. It's so familiar to Peter that he doesn't trigger his Spider-Sense. So Venom beats up Rhino and Shocker like it's nothing, and then is like, hey, Peter, I'm gonna f***ing kill you. <laughs> and then the whole episode is this chase through New York because Venom is stronger, he's faster, he can get the jump on Peter in a way that no one else can because of the, the whole, like, spider sense mm -hmm. thing. And he knows all of Peter's secrets because of the symbiote, so he is two completely different avenues of terrifying villain that Peter's never had to encounter before with, like, being able to be snuck up on and then having all of Peter's secrets compromised. So this episode is remarkably tense by the standards of 90s cartoons. The whole episode is just Peter completely on the ropes the whole time. He almost gets dangled in front of a bunch of news cameras with his mask off, Ooh. and he's able to kind of get out of the scrape and eventually lead Venom to a rocket launch site where they're going to, you know, shoot another probe back up into space, and he leads Venom into where the rocket is. And then when it takes off, the sound vibrations from the rockets going off make the symbiote freak out, so it debonds from Eddie, and then Peter manages to web it onto the probe, and then send it off into space like, okay, hurrah, day is saved. But this episode is so good. <laughs> Genuinely some of my favorite Venom content I've ever seen. Just right out the gate, they nail how terrifying a villain like this can be. Because yeah. we know what it does to Peter, and we know, okay, a guy like Eddie Brock who's already, like, a bad, angry dude, mm -hmm. yeah, that's gonna be a horrible combination for Spidey to deal with. It's, it's absolutely A-plus stuff. It's really interesting, uh, two things really interesting. First of all, hearing things and being like, oh, so that's why they did it like that in this later adaptation, and that's why they did it like that in this other adaptation, like, all of these little details. Also, I really like how the way they're doing the highlighting color on Venom. Yeah. It's not just blue, it's blue and red, like Spider-Man's yeah. original suit. Because, of course, the whole thing, yep. like, there's nothing innately spider-like about the symbiote. It gained these properties by bonding with Spider-Man first and then just being his mm -hmm. friendly neighborhood super suit for a while. But then when it bonds with Eddie, it's like, well, the spider gimmick was working great before. We'll just do that, but again. Yeah. Which is also why in the movies, he they can't justify giving him the spider emblem because in, in the Venom movies, the ones that currently exist he was never bonded with with spider-man so it's just yeah. this, this big black shape yeah it's just, a, it's just it's just a guy just a just a it's just very a, just gloopy a guy goopy guy <laughs> hudson river pollution rich <laughs> thick and creamy Stop. <laughs> oh so awful 
Detailed diatribe. Hudson River pollution. No. no. Can you imagine? Uh, my villain arc. This is my symbiote arc. Yeah. <laughs> Just bringing up all the times the Hudson River comes up in movies. We can bring up national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the, the original two instances uh, from the previous century. First comic run, first animated run. Comic run was a, a very interesting idea. Executed pretty well, considering they were fully flying by the seat of their pants as they did this. Mm. And then for the first, like, kind of bespoke crafted three-parter, uh, a, a tight narrative around this thing. The animated series absolutely nails it, and it is 100% worth a watch for the, the window into the older cartoons, uh, but also just to see how they handle this, because it's so surprising in a way that I was genuinely not expecting. It was so, so, so cool to see this. But this now takes us to the next age of, of Spider-Man media that many of us encountered, which was the Raimi movies. <laughs> and I now present to you my absolute most Joker-fied oh, takes no. on the Raimi trilogy, for which I am not sorry. <sighs> and I don't... I, I, I'm not asking for forgiveness, uh, nor permission. <laughs> I am just... I, I, I watched all three of these through uh, this past week. And after I finished Spider-Man 2, my first thought was, oh no. And then after I finished Spider-Man 3, my first thought was again, oh no. Uh, and I texted you, Red, yep. and I'm like, you're going to f***ing hate what conclusions I've come to. Y'all have to understand, I've been bracing myself for like 48 hours preparing for this moment, and I still don't know what's going to happen here. <laughs> I don't know what to expect. So allow me to commit verifiable heresy. Oh boy. I think Spider-Man 2 kind of misses its own <gasps> point a little bit. What? And I... I'm aware that this feels fully heretical, so allow me to explain. Yes, I, I require the, clarification. <laughs> yes. The core conflict of this movie that everyone remembers is Peter balancing his responsibilities as Peter Parker and his responsibilities as Spider-Man. And those two things are in conflict because he doesn't have the time to do all of those things. He struggles with class, with work, with social life, with his home life, you know, being able to afford, uh, you know, his apartment in Aunt May's house. And all of these things are screwed up by the commitment of being Spider-Man. The first three quarters of this movie are fundamentally perfect. Like, this is a great analysis of why a character like Spider-Man would say, this is a curse, I want out of this, I, my life is so much better when I'm, when I'm not having to deal with this. Uh, and then eventually when he decides to be, you know, Spider-Man no more, he rejects both the power and the responsibility, says, get this sh off of me, I'm done. I, I just want to be Peter Parker and that's it. I, I can deal with my Peter responsibilities, but I cannot deal with my Spider-Man responsibilities too. So forget the power, I don't want it. To clarify, he didn't like, decide to start losing his powers. That started happening on its own. He didn't know why it was happening. It is heavily implied by the subtext that it's happening because he and MJ are on the rocks again, you know, very standard stuff. But like, he wasn't like, I've still got my powers, but he like started losing his powers and stopped being able to Spider-Man. So so that's why he was like, yeah, okay, well. Yeah, it slowly starts to, to abandon him over the course of, of the films. And it's when he has this big like fall down an alleyway that he's like, okay, you know what, maybe screw this. Yeah, because he stops being able to stick to walls. He can't, because they did the weird organic web shooters thing for these movies. So like he, he can't web sling. And, you know, he, his vision gets f***y again, so it's like, there's a lot of reasons yeah. why being Spider-Man is no longer practical. He's, we, we discussed this in the, um, in one of the various, uh, superhero detailed diatribes, I think it was Empty- I think it was, uh, I think it was Superheroes in, in Empty Worlds? I agree, yeah, I think that yeah. was right. Where it was like, it's not that he's like, uh, I'm gonna retire, it's just like, okay, he literally, he's not, he can't, he doesn't have his powers anymore, so he's like, f***, I guess I can actually have a work-life balance again, this is wild. But he does still feel the- the sting of not being able to as easily rescue people because he is still fundamentally, you know, just Peter Parker at heart. He's a good dude. At first, things are going great. We got the hot dog meme. Everything's fine. He stops being just an empty seat to Mary Jane. His school improves. His work improves. Things are going great for Peter. But, right as you mentioned, New York begins to suffer for it. He sees a mugging that he can't stop and he can't save someone from a burning building. He still has this heroic drive to try and help people, but he's like, okay, well, I'm, I'm just one guy now. I've, I, my, my powers failed me, and then I'm like, okay, fine, I'm just gonna be Peter. And he's able to save the one person, but he can't save the other. The, the person dies in the fourth floor, and it's like, ah, this is, this is dramatic. It's this conflict of like, ah, I have what I want, but is it worth it? Is the city safe? Am I, like, morally okay with 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 how this has happened and this is good mm -hmm. this, this is good stuff it's tasty good stuff movie. pretty good I, i'm enjoying this so far good movie the problem is that ah. in the last quarter of the movie peter's entire motivation collapses down to only mary jane 
Specifically, Doc Ock kidnaps Mary Jane as a way to get to Peter Parker anyway? So the whole point of like, at the end of Spider-Man 1, oh Mary Jane, I can't love you, I can't be with you because it'll put you in danger, is made bull by the fact that she's endangered anyway, possibly even more so because if, if, if Mary Jane and Peter were on the same page, they wouldn't have been in the scenario where Doc Ock could have just come and captured her. And it feels a little bit like, hmm, Peter's big secret strategy isn't actually keeping his friends safe. And then after Mary Jane gets captured, he just gets his powers back because this, I guess, was the one motivation he needed to be like, oh, maybe I do need to save people. Like, that guy who died in a fire, my girlfriend's in, my maybe well, girlfriend's in danger. Uh, it's, okay, the problem is this is a very cruel, very smart thing you've done here because you pinpointed the one part of this movie that I cannot in good conscience defend. <laughs> <laughs> because I am the number one hater of poorly integrated romantic subplots that I don't find compelling. I think you are correct in your assessment that this is the weakest part of an otherwise extremely good movie. Otherwise very good movie, doesn't yeah. doesn't yeah, ruin yeah. It. it, you know. And this is why I'm taking a very specific read of this, where I'm not saying Spider-Man 2 is a bad movie. I know that I was kind of like setting it up that way for the meme. <laughs> but the, the, the point is that thematically, the core question of how does <laughs> Spider-Man balance his powers and responsibilities? What happens when those two things are out of balance? The answer in that movie is very compelling until it's, oh, Mary Jane. And then it's just yeah. everything else doesn't matter. And that that hurts me. So on the thematic level, this movie does so well until it completely like tabletops itself and undercuts the message it was trying to say. And it's, it's icky to watch. I feel bad because I'm like, oh, you were doing so well. Yeah. Why did you have to do this to yourself? You could have just carried it home perfectly. But ah, so ah, it makes me makes me sad. Yeah. Um, and then I feel like I'm a heretic for, for saying stuff like this. <laughs> well, I feel like you're you're taking a, an analytical angle on this that a lot of people haven't, which is specifically how well do these movies do the symbiote arc? Um, and well, in this case, how do the how well do they approach the symbiote question? Because the purpose of Spider-Man Two, I would say, is a little bit tangential to the symbiote question. Because what mm -hmm. happens when Peter's powers and responsibilities fall out of balance is like an accurate framing, but they're sort of opposing instances of it. Because the symbiote, of course, it powers him up, but at the cost that it it makes him wildly irresponsible. He gets greater power and less sense of responsibility because he's precisely being, yeah. Well, he he's being like you know, influenced by this, not necessarily malevolent, but like bad for him force. Whereas in Spider-Man 2, he gets, his power is stripped away from him for reasons he doesn't understand, but he's like, oh, this might be good because I don't have that responsibility anymore. And it's not until, you know, he kind of has it driven home, like, oh no, I don't have power, but I still feel the responsibility. And it's like worse because I don't have the power to actually act on it. I, I would say that, that Spider-Man 2 succeeds if we frame it as necessary setup for the symbiote arc, which is Peter needs to at some point decide that being Spider-Man is more important than anything else in his life. And that is the core theme of Spider-Man 2. That's like the recurring yeah. thing, the whole like, sometimes we have to give up the things we love, even our dreams, you know, to do what's right. Like yeah. that, that's the recurring line in the movie. And basically Peter starts the movie like, man, I'm I'm trying to be Spider-Man, but it's it's getting in the way of everything else I want. I can't spend time with my aunt, with my not girlfriend and school and my teachers are disappointed. And then he gets all that and he's like, well, I'm kind of living the dream. I'm walking on sunshine, but also this sucks. Uh, so, yeah. like, this is the thing that they do in a lot of hero's journey kind of type things where initially, you know, you've got the refusal of the call and then, you know, smack the hero around for refusing the call and then they get on the journey. But it's important to give them at some point the turning point where they choose to continue. And in the first Spider-Man movie, a lot of that is kind of being dragged along by circumstance. Like, yeah. or, or he's dragged along by his sense of responsibility. He's like, I f***ed up, I got Uncle Ben killed. There's a sense that he's like, I have to atone in some way. You know, I, I can it's never- It's reactive. Yeah, exactly. And then in Spider-Man 2, it's wearing him down. He needs to essentially choose to continue. And I think that's the purpose that the movie serves, that he needs to decide to be Spider-Man rather than just stumble into it and then continue because it's convenient. Uh, and I think for that purpose, it does work. And I do think it is necessary setup for the symbiote arc, because once Peter has committed to being Spider-Man, once he's like, okay, as long as I am able, and even when I'm not, I will be Spider-Man, because that is what is important. I'll, I'll give up on my dreams if I have to, because this is my responsibility. That's good stuff. 
And then if you throw in the symbiote arc, it's like, hey, don't you want to be Spider-Man better? Think of how much more efficient you would be. Think of how much more powerful. Think of how many more people you could save if you were stronger or faster, or you had freaky organic web shooters. What a wild <laughs> concept. <laughs> um, like, I, I think that it's important to have him decide to be Spider-Man before he can overcorrect and then have to reel it back in and be like, hold on, hold on. Yeah. I need standards. I've seen what it was like to have no power. Now I need to decide how I feel about having too much power. So, yeah. so I, I think I think Spider-Man Two was set up for a a potential really good movie. So what what did they make, Blue? What movie did they make? <laughs> so in the third one, they specifically asked that question in the context of the symbiote itself, uh -huh. and from a strictly thematic angle, mm -hmm. I think they actually do a really good job. Mm -hmm. So long as we're willing to ignore <laughs> some some iffy acting, some some pretty. Some pretty crummy dialogue, and we just pretend that Venom never shows up. Uh, this if is... we can do those things, we're solid. <laughs> this is one because... of those, there's a good 20-minute short film in this movie just begging to be released in the editing room. <laughs> no, there. I my, my take is that as much of Spider-Man 2 as I liked, about three quarters, is as much of Spider-Man 3 as I liked. Hmm. So as we get into this, we activate the edge, and I am <laughs> devastated to report that Spider-Man 3 is unironically my favorite movie of the lot, God and I it. do not think it is of substantially worse quality than the other two. <laughs> it's this this knows itself in the same way as both those other ones do. I I'm sorry. It it <laughs> understands the assignment. Being the symbiote means Peter's gotta be a bastard, and this movie does it! I mean, it also does, like, five other things, which is kind of the problem with this movie. Ah, uh, yeah, well... They were like, uh, they spent the last two movies setting up Lizard, and then the someone in the editing room or whatever was like, No Lizard, we need Venom, and Sandman, we haven't done Sandman yet. Oh, and Hobgoblin, we need to throw in Hobgoblin. <laughs> as like, all at once? And it's like, no, obviously, in order. So first we do Hobgoblin, and then we give Harry amnesia, then we bring in Sandman, and then we wash him down a storm drain, and then we can do Venom, and then that's just in time for Hobgoblin and Sandman to come back in the finale, and it's like, do we have time to pencil in Lizard? No! <laughs> so, but no, obviously this movie is an underrated masterpiece. <laughs> Not a masterpiece. Uh, I say it's my favorite. I don't mean that it's good. Uh, I mean that it's my favorite. That's and those an important are different. distinction, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I will make my case for it, bearing in mind that I'm being a little bit of an edgelord here, but I think that's in keeping with the theme and the premise of this movie. So, uh, we so all let, let's go through it. park at age 14. I'm not going to throw stones yeah. in the edgelord department. <laughs> yeah. I saw this movie at exactly the right age. I was like 11. It was oh, perfect. So. Yeah. <laughs> what was that quote? There, uh, the, there was that Cosmonaut video recently about Spider-Man Lotus. And he was talking about one of the guys that made the movie. He's like, like most uh, brown haired white boys, this guy likes Spider-Man a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. So. <laughs> so what's your point? <laughs> what about it? <laughs> anyway. Uh, no. Uh. <laughs> ah, it's fine. Uh. <laughs> Oh my god, okay. Yeah, so so as we begin, things are going great, at least from Peter's perspective. Mm. He's learned to balance his life being Peter and Spider-Man, he's there for MJ, seeing her shows, but he's still not fully present emotionally. He's only really focused on how great things are going for him, and he's not super aware of the difficulties that MJ is facing in her personal life. He's got absolutely maximum guy blinders on at the beginning <laughs> of this movie. He is not emotionally open to meaningfully process uh, the things that Mary Jane is going through. And this this causes some problems. Even before he gets the symbiote, he's, he's starting to go a little bit bonkers here. His ending arc begins with just his pure selfishness around MJ, kissing Gwen Stacy, at the key to the city festival for funsies and ruining his own proposal by completely talking over MJ when she hasn't even had the opportunity to say, hey, Peter, I got cut from my show. Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, well, don't worry about it. Like, people print all kinds of bad stuff about Spider-Man, but you just got to keep going. And MJ's like, Peter, you're not listening to me. <laughs> and then eventually she's, you know what? Fine, screw this. I'm out. And he screws up his own proposal. It's, it's a whole thing. And then he learns that Sandman is actually the person who killed Uncle Ben. 
and he wants to get revenge. That's a very volatile mix where in this in this first like hour of, of, of stuff happening, he manages to ruin his own romantic life mm -hmm. and throw himself into a real tizzy over this this revenge quest that he suddenly set himself on because it it scrapes all the way down to the fundamental core of his character of his origin story with Uncle Ben and power and responsibility. And suddenly all of that is surfaced yeah. immediately in gruesome fashion all at once. So he's this strung up mess just sitting in his apartment for hours and hours listening to the police scanner, waiting for Sandman to come on just so that he can go fight him. Yeah. MJ shows up, she's like, look, I don't care about what happened at dinner. I just want to make sure that you're okay. So Spider-Man is not emotionally open <laughs> and willing to assist Mary Jane for the help that she needs, like, psychologically and romantically. Mm -hmm. And then she's like, look, I'm going to put that behind me. I know that you need help. I'm here. And Peter's like, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and just sends her away. Yeah. He's a dick. I did want to say there were two things about this specific anal analytical chunk that I really liked, uh, which is that on the one hand, the thing about, oh, the, I thought this guy killed Uncle Ben, but retcon, it was this other guy. Holy <laughs> is like interesting because he thought he was past that. He thought he'd already fucked that up. Depending on the version, I think in the movies, the guy who shot Uncle Ben like accidentally like blats himself out a window and-, and He trips and falls to Right, and dies yeah. anyway. And it's like, well, that sucks. But like this whole, like this whole horrible night is like the crucible in which Spider-Man is formed. It's like, okay, I let this guy go. And then he killed my uncle and I pursued him in a blind rage and I didn't kill him, but he still died. And I just never want any of this to happen again. And then he gets told, hey, the guy who killed your uncle is actually still there. He thought this was a solved problem. And it turns out yeah. it's very much not. It is a aggressively not. When he's faced with that, he is still just as angry as he was that night. And I think that's a really interesting way to unpack, you know, a character's formative trauma. Is like, oh, you thought this was just your motivational thing? You thought this was your tragic backstory? It's here, baby. You gotta figure out yeah. what you're gonna do about it now that you've undergone all this character development. And I just think that, again, like you pointed out, like, this is consistent characterization for both of them. They, they've taken these two characters that have been pretty solidly established and have just put them in a tense situation that's pulling them in different directions. Peter's caught up in his head, which has been a problem regularly, and MJ is like, hey, I could really just use any emotional support right now from anybody because I have nobody. <laughs> and uh, yeah. and Peter's like, uh, man, that sounds really tough, but you know what else is tough? Having a dead uncle. So, you know, <laughs> gotta go, babe. <laughs> Legitimately, I, I find Spider-Man 3 compelling in how it is a legitimate tragedy. Mm. It's it's a Greek tragedy in the same way that the Star Wars prequels are a tragedy. The parts that are dumb as hell are dumb as hell, but then there's stuff in this in the middle of it that's like, oh wow, that's actually like genuinely very affecting and sad and mm. like hard to watch in a compelling way. So like this movie can be dumb as in some places, but like there's some things that they do really, really well. I think the problem I keep running into with this movie is that I didn't have any fun watching it. I had so much fun watching Spider-Man 2. I had a decent amount of fun watching Spider-Man 1. And basically the only time I had fun with Spider-Man 3 was when I was like, really? Bonked on the head amnesia? <laughs> okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> Peter's like, I should concuss my enemies far more often. This is working out great for me. Yeah, Harry, and even then, like, P uh, Harry gets concussed and Spider-Man's like, oh, this is great. Like, I've ruined this man's life? No, this is fantastic for me. <laughs> <laughs> he's just forgotten all the bad bits like the next time harry starts making like moves you just, you just see peter behind him like raising a kosh <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> worst yeah. wonders last time yeah, i can do this again yeah. so of course then in in the midst of this the situation where spider-man's is like waiting for the police scanner to to turn up sandman mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh he falls asleep passes out the the symbiote takes control oh yeah we need to mention the symbiote uh, the symbiote showed up. Uh, it, it fell from space while Peter and MJ were hanging out in Central Park, and then it just kind of yeah. hitched a ride on Peter's Vespa, and then it uh, ambushed him in the night. This is just a thing that yeah. we have to accept is happening. In the it's mean, just a thing. I think this is after the Hobgoblin thing, where Harry bonks his head and loses his memory. And Yeah, that's pretty early. And it's also after we get our intro shot of Sandman, uh, where he looks directly into the camera and says, I'm not a bad person, and then leaves. And... Uh, yeah, we're... Yeah, all that stuff's happened already. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. So th this is an hour in at this point. Like, we've, we've established the whole, like, like the Hobgoblin thing. We've got Sandman going on. we got this whole proposal sequence. We, we, we've had a lot of uh, stuff happening already in this movie. This is a dense-ass movie. <laughs> it has to so... be. It's three movies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's why it's called Spider-Man 3. It's actually Spider-Man cubed. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, so Peter wakes up on the side of a building with a new suit, got that, uh, that new score, just kicking ass, having a good time. And it is excessive use of force time. Whee! The first thing that Peter does is find Sandman, kill him, and then brag about it to Aunt May the very next day. Holy <laughs> <laughs> It's like a cat bringing a dead bird home, like, are you proud of me, mother? <laughs> and it's like, this is what he wanted to do. He already wanted, he was waiting on the police scanner so that he can go and do exactly this. The suit just gave him the power to do it. So when he, you know, like he drowns him and then it turns to, to wet sand and he falls through the thing and Spider-Man says, good riddance. Like, that's what Peter wanted from as soon as he heard that that Flint Mark is actually the guy who killed his uncle. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he's do he's doing bad things, but the suit is only enabling him to do what his, his deep, awful sh <laughs> desires were encouraging him to do in the first place. Which is interesting because unpacking that morally speaking is, it, it's one of those contentious questions in real life of like, Obviously, the general consensus is like having bad thoughts does not make you a bad person. It's what you it's the actions you take that, that matter mm -hmm. the most in that regard. But like, you know, w when you're in your own head and you're like, oh, man, the fact that I thought about this terrible thing makes me bad. Or like, what's the difference between thinking this horrible thing and doing this horrible thing? It's like there, there's a very big difference. But like when you're <laughs> a wide gulf, <laughs> when you're in your head, it doesn't feel like that. And then we enter the world of spec fic and like sci fi where it's like, hey, you could be like mind controlled or you can, you know, you can have something that just like reaches into your head and pulls out your darkest desires and you can be compelled or uh, even in like the real world, it's like, hey, if you're like really, really f***ing tired and like at the end of your rope and you're maybe, a, you've got a little bit less of a filter than normal and you say something that under normal circumstances you would never say and it's like, oh my gosh, like obviously that, that was in my head but I wouldn't have let it out if I wasn't abs yeah. at the absolute end of my rope and then you get something like this and it's like, okay, how responsible is Peter for this? That this this alien thing bonded with him so completely, reached into his head and was like, ooh, that, we're gonna do that. And it's like, the way that this movie is framed, it's pretty clear that Peter holds himself very responsible for that because that is the nature of Peter Parker. But like, we, the audience, are kind of like, well, he's under the influence of the, the, the symbiote, which is objectively like an evil alien space monster thing. So like... How how much is this Peter's fault? Like, it's taking ideas from his head, but would he have ever done this without them? Impossible to say at this point. And I think that's interesting because I don't think that ac ever actually gets resolved in this specific arc. Because the movie's too busy being two other movies. <laughs> because it's too busy being two other entire movies, uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. I, I find this pairing of the symbiote story with the this version of Sandman to be really A-plus thematic pairing because you have to go to the origin of Peter's like lesson in power and responsibility with the magic alien suit that completely corrupts his power and responsibility by giving him turbo power mm -hmm. and absolutely no filter or restraint whatsoever. So like you said, like maybe, you know, red and blue suit Peter would have just gone and roughed up Sandman and then found a way to capture him and leave him for the police, but with the suit in power, whatever line there might have been gets blurred, and since he has the power to freaking kill him, he does. And and that that pairing, I, I think, is really, really cool to, to put those together. So you have kind of both aspects and both angles of the power and responsibility question being asked, which is some of the ways in which I feel like this movie kind of knows what it's doing, despite the <laughs> fact that it's bloated and it has way too much stuff going on. There are some points where I'm like, Nah, there's there's something here. It's like the same way that I watched the prequels where it's like, what were they trying to do? <laughs> yes. Forget what's actually on screen. What were they going for and what can we actually pull out of this if we're willing to be a little bit analytical and take the story on what it was trying to say rather than what it actually ended up clumsily saying? Mm. That's what I enjoy about this one on an analytical level watching it. So we, we continue on uh, next sequence. This, uh, <laughs> uh, this damn door just ain't fixed. Man, that sucks, don't it? Yep. But also he realizes he's gone too far. As soon as he like yells at Mr. Ditkovich, he goes inside, he looks at himself in the mirror, he's like, oh my my hair's down, I'm I'm super edgy. This is I'm going too far. I need to take this thing off. So he takes the black suit, throws it in the bin, he apologizes to Mr. Ditkovich, and he's like, Okay, I too much, pull back, bring it back, I can I can be normal Peter again yeah. and just try to like turn things around and be good. There's a couple things about that that I actually remember quite liking the first time I watched this movie, which is of course when he does the, you know, you'll get your room when you fix this damn door. Uh, the thing that I liked about that is that the immediate reaction of Mr. Dikovich, which is a fucking cute name, yeah. I gotta say, is yeah. uh, he's like, oh, hmm. Like, cause we've only seen this man in the context of being 
kind of annoying, kind of rude, yeah. and like he's, he's Peter's landlord. And of course, Peter's constantly broke, so it's always a point of rent. Peter's too polite, so it's like, oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Dikovich, I'll get your rent. And then, so w when we see him get yelled at, we're like, oh no. And then he's just like, he's a nice boy. Something must be wrong. And it's yeah. like, it's just, we're so used to seeing Peter get relentlessly sh** upon by absolutely everybody in the world that it's kind mm -hmm. of nice to see somebody who we otherwise had really no reason to, like, assume would be kind or, or generous in his interpretation of his actions just be like, no, hold on. I know this kid too well to think that that was, like, normal behavior. That, like, this, this guy is is too kind to act like that even under stress. So something must yeah. be up. And it's just, it's such a rare, like, moment of kindness in a world that is otherwise pretty dedicated to making Peter's life worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, also, we're sort of glossing over most of the stuff he does while under the symbiote's influence. Like, he does the he does the dancing thing, and... Uh, we'll get to that. That comes later. Oh, really? But he binned the black suit. He, he's binned it, but he hasn't gotten rid of it. He just throws it in his cupboard. Oh, or in his closet. Okay, all right. So this is his first rejection of it. Gotcha. This is when he's made the connection, like, something's up and I think it's this. Okay. Yeah. I'm up to speed. Yeah. It's been a few years yeah. since I watched this movie. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> However, after that, he's like, okay, I'm gonna be good, but then... Harry regains his memory mm -hmm. and resolves to completely ruin Peter's life. Yeah. So then we once again get to things are just going really, really, really bad. In this context, Peter decides that actually he's done with being nice and he <laughs> goes back on his BS, uh, gets the black suit again, remesses up his hair and confronts <laughs> Harry at his house and proceeds to have the most knockdown, drag out brawl that Spider-Man has had in any of these movies. Yeah. Usually Peter's very acrobatic. He's jumping around. He's like, he's quipping. He's like using his web shooters and stuff. This is a bar fight. Yeah. Completely out of character for Peter because he just wants to hurt Harry yeah. for what he's done. It's It's got this, like, interesting twist of catharsis while also being, like, bad. Because, again, we've spent the last two and a half movies just seeing Peter kind of get relentlessly sh** on by everybody. Uh, and because he has to keep it a secret, you know, he, he almost never gets to be like, Hey, I had a f***ing good reason, <laughs> okay? Stop being mean to me. This is kind of the apotheosis of like, aren't you tired of being nice? Don't you want to go ape sh**? But then shortly thereafter, <laughs> it's like, no, going ape sh** is making me feel bad. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, not not in this situation not because he does that. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes to the bugle, and Eddie Brock has at this point gotten the staff job after this whole thing. He's got these pictures of Spidey like stealing from a bank. Yeah, with sequence a, earlier with a big cartoon bag of money. <laughs> Yeah, and Peter then humiliates Eddie in front of the whole office by showing that his pictures are faked photoshops of Peter's earlier work. Mm. And Eddie's like, hey, like, please don't do this to me, man. And Peter's like, you want forgiveness? Get religion. <laughs> and he just completely leaves him out to dry uh, in the middle of the entire office. So he, he's basically taken out two of his antagonists in a row, and then he proceeds to go on his victory lap across New York. <laughs> the absolute sleaziest victory lap imaginable on his way to a date with Gwen Stacy. This is when we get the musical number when he's running around harassing random women on the street. Yeah, this is at least in character. I kind of like that the black suit doesn't actually make Peter cool. It just kind of makes him think he's cool. Exactly. A very important distinction. <laughs> yes. And this takes us to the next sequence where, after having learned from Harry that Mary Jane lost her job and is now a singing waitress at a restaurant, which is like the ultimate humiliation for her, like she got her break on Broadway and it just completely blew up in her face, Peter proceeds to take Gwen Stacy to MJ's restaurant <laughs> to humiliate Mary Jane in front of her face, where she's about to go sing her song, he jumps on the piano, he cuts her off, he starts dancing, yep. he grabs Gwen and does his whole number in the middle of the routine, and then as they finish, like, he's staring dead in Mary Jane's eyes, and Gwen Stacy is like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Was I your accessory for this? And then she apologizes to MJ, runs away, and is like, I'm so sorry, I'm, I'm so embarrassed, I'm humiliated, because what Peter did was... Deeply completely horrifying and, yeah. he, and then immediately after he gets into this scuffle because he wants to confront Mary Jane and be like look at me like I'm the big man now mm -hmm. he gets into a fist fight with the bouncers he hits Mary Jane in the scuffle and this isn't just a cringy sequence where he thinks he's being cool but he's not yeah. this is utterly horrifying behavior it's his most selfish vicious and misogynistic point that he's ever been in where you take this kid who doesn't really understand how to deal mm -hmm. with icky social situations and he just weaponizes people against each other by objectifying Gwen to spite MJ in front of both of them were 
Both of them feel awful as a result of this. Yeah. And then he hits one of them. It's like, this is... He's the most high on his own glory that he's ever been. And this is like fully the suit. Like, it, it, it took what Peter gave it, and now it's just like... We're going to be bad, yeah. and we're reveling in being bad. It, it's cranked everything up to 11. I also, I think that there is, um, I do remember that one part of this scene that I actually was like, oh, shit, that's good writing, was when Gwen put this shit together, apologized mm -hmm. to MJ, and booked it. Again, yeah. like, I didn't give this movie enough credit for clearing the through-the-floor bar of, like, writing <laughs> writing female love interests for superheroes <laughs> in the year of our yeah. Lord 2000-something. What I think is interesting about this sequence is that for the first part, Peter's, like, in control. He's arranged mm -hmm. this. He's like, I'm gonna bring my new girlfriend to the girl who dumped me to show her how fuck... This is, like, the equivalent of his revenge body. And then, <laughs> as soon as Gwen cottons onto what's going on, I think... It's not exactly sunk cost, but he loses control of the situation, and that's when things escalate. That's when it turns into the fight. That's when MJ gets yeah. backhanded. Because, like, to be clear, he didn't, like, set out to punch her. It was, like, a bit of a just, you know, limbs flying situation. Violence had become his intrinsic or immediate reflex at that point, yeah. and then MJ being in that situation got and, hit. And she him. looks at him in horror, but also with a certain amount of concern, like, that's clearly when she's like, oh, something's wrong. He's not just being uncharacteristically a dick. He would never do that. And Peter also yeah. has this moment of like, what just happened? Uh, but I yeah. do think how before that, the, he's sort of in the the like the unhappy middle ground of like, all right, things have kind of spiraled out of control. But if I if I back off, if I don't double down, like what what am I a coward or something like that? Like he he's clearly very hopped up on this sort of like extremely aggressive. I have to commit. I have to double down. This all has to be intentional. You know, get off me, man. Uh, kind of vibe, and that's when that's when he hits the breaking point with when he accidentally s sort of yeah. backhands MJ and is like, oh, doubling down is bad. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the fact that they make this as horrifying as it is is really important because we need to we need to believe that Peter has reached the point where he's like, oh, okay, this cannot continue. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the next scene is him talking to Aunt May, and she says that what you have to do is the hardest thing, which is forgive yourself. Mm -hmm. So he's like, oh, I can't, but I suck, though. <laughs> so he has this big brooding sequence where he's on the side of the bell tower in the yeah. rain. And he goes inside, he tries to yeet the suit, and, you know, the, the bell rings, and it, the, the, the symbiote suit, like, has its own face that, like, screams off of him when he hits it. It's yeah. a great sequence, super dramatic. Um, Eddie goes to church and asks God to kill Peter Parker, which is not how <laughs> prayer works. Fully not. Like, I'm agnostic, but, like, Quack. man, that's not, that that ain't it, dude. Yeah. And and even still, without, like, the whole Venom thing, the, this last little little chunk of the movie, this last little 20% is, is, is pretty useless. But see him still come to a complete, come through a complete arc of falling to selfishness and spite and violence and then rejecting it and finding a healing through love and compassion to his friends, his enemies in, in the form of Sandman. And I, I feel like they've kind of done a good job of the symbiote story. The cleanup is pretty damn messy, <laughs> but I don't see the themes retroactively undercut in the way that I find myself frustrated by Spider-Man 2. Mm. So once again, I am begging to be proven <laughs> wrong. I did not want to come to this conclusion. I am seeking freedom <laughs> from the prison that is my mind. <laughs> the thing is like, overall, the problem with this movie is the way it's put together. This is one of those yeah. things where it's like, the movie is bad with good bits in it. That is, yes. that, is yes. a, that is a truth of a lot of bad media. That's why I spend so much time dissecting bad media, because a lot of them has good things in it. And I think the analytical perspective of like, what part of this... Like, what were they trying to do and where do they succeed and how do they fail and why? I think that is one of the most interesting things you can do with a piece of media to, to analyze it. And in this case, if this were all they were trying to do, uh, they would have done a tolerable job. The the execution, yeah. we, we need to be pretty generous with a lot of the reads on these key scenes. Like, the, yeah. the whole, oh, like, yeah. oh, Peter has fully committed to the symbiote is like okay, yeah, this should probably be the darkest, most horrifying part of this. Like what you were describing with the 90s animated series where it's like, oh, he nearly kills Rhino and that's not even the worst of it. Like that's no. that's up there, but like more bad Quack. keeps happening. We didn't really get that. Uh, instead, what we got was how is this affecting Peter Parker? And we get 
we, we get it sort of sandwiched with horror where it's like, okay, him having a knockdown drag out brawl with Harry and <laughs> Phantom of the opera him with his own grenade. That's, <laughs> that's horrifying. Like first, but it's kind of like tempered with the fact that like, well, Harry is being a world-class dickhead and that was his own grenade. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, like father, like son, I guess. Uh, and then of course the scene in the bar is much more horrifying. But then in the middle, we get a, dorky ass dance sequence that everybody makes fun of. And it's like, it's one of those things where if you think about it for long enough, you're like, okay, it is in character for Peter to be an absolute doofus when hopped up, you know, high on his own supply. But like, I don't know if this scene serves the purpose it was supposed to, because I'm not sure what purpose that scene was supposed to serve. I guess it was supposed to be like, he's got confidence now. He's making a fool of himself in public and he thinks he's being cool. And it's like, okay, but I thought this was supposed to be about how this is turning him into a monster, not kind of a douchebag. <laughs> it, it has a lot of ideas that do not come together as well as they should, and it requires a generous read. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like the apotheosis of the, the symbiote is kind of in how it manifests in Venom after Peter rejects it. Because again, a lot of Peter's actions when he's influenced by the symbiote is feeling vengeful and being like, okay, now I can justify excessive force. And then of course, when he rejects the symbiote, the symbiote reacts exactly the same way. Uh, in some framings, they even make it like almost romantic. Like you rejected me, well, that's yeah. okay. Look at my revenge body, I call him Eddie Brock. <laughs> and there's there's even like a, a recurring tidbit that sometimes shows up in these arcs where Peter will like, he, Venom has him basically beat and he'll reach out to the symbiote and be like, baby, please take me back and like lure yeah. the symbiote off of Eddie. Cause it always works because Eddie is the rebound. We'll see that in a second. We will, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I think that like, what this means is that the symbiote arc, the Black Suit Spider-Man arc, it's it's a very important arc for Peter, but it kind of, Venom becomes what could have happened if Peter hadn't gotten his <laughs> together. Like we know, yeah. oh, Peter's got a, an ironclad moral compass in there. Sometimes it gets a little bit banged up, but ultimately he'll always like, if he does something <laughs> up, he'll at least feel bad about it forever. Like at least we can fall yeah. back on oh, that. Yeah. And then you look at Venom and you're like, the guy in that suit does not have any superpowers. This is how strong the symbiote can make that guy. And he's yeah. going toe to toe with Spider-Man. He's more than a physical match for him. So how much was Peter like holding it back while it was bonded to him? Like how, what, what could he have become if he had let himself, you know, fall into it? And that's interesting because of course, Peter looks at this thing and sees literally his dark reflection. It's wearing his logo. Every time yeah. he fights Venom, he's staring in the face, one of the worst periods of his life and what he could have become if he hadn't made the very painful sacrifice to like get rid of this thing. And that is an extremely powerful thing to do because again, if we wanted to, read this movie very generously and tie it back in with other themes, we've already seen how he's handled like, oh, I thought I'd resolved this, but here it is staring me in the face with Sandman. And the answer was he handled it badly. He handled it so badly that he thought he yep. killed the guy and felt nothing. If he's like, I've gotten rid of the black suit, I'm okay, I'm free. I, I can go back to being a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. And then Venom rolls up and Venom is like, what's up? All of your worst days and worst thoughts, I know all of them and I'm going to <laughs> act on them if you won't. Like that, that's such an interesting nightmare scenario, especially for somebody as responsibility-minded as Spider-Man. And it just does not get explored in this movie because the, the version of Venom we get is a very kind of bare bones manifestation. It's like Eddie Brock is a garden variety dick and he gets the Venom suit and he becomes a more powerful asshole with the exact same characterization he already had. They don't even put any stank on his voice, man. That's like, that's the one thing with Venom. You gotta like, you gotta buzz it up. You gotta layer it, you know, give it a little voice of Legion, make it hiss. And then it's instead you just get Topher Grace being like, I hate the spider. You hate the spider. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hang out, man. Just... That's even stankier than uh, Topher Grace's oh, voice yeah. in that scene with the yeah, cough. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, you look at this and you're like, okay, there was a good idea here. And it's like, yeah, there was a good idea here. We saw it in the 1990s animated Spider-Man and then the, the 2000s animated Spider-Man that we're about to talk about in one slide. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, th there's a good concept here and parts of it work, but that doesn't mean that the movie itself is actually good. It means it has a good thread woven through it. And even yeah. then they don't quite tie it off right because this needs to be tied no, off with him defeating Venom. That's how you resolve this arc. 
And in this case, he defeats Venom with, oh, I made a big loud noise and it freaked out and then I think exploded or something. I don't remember what they do with it. Uh, uh, it was one of the goblin grenades. Okay, yeah, yeah. So so they, they make it go all blah and then they explode it. It's very, not exactly like confronting your own dark side, which no. is kind of what you would want from, you know, Spider-Man versus Venom. <laughs> You know, I, I will grant that there are parts of this movie that pull off what it's trying to do, but they're pretty thinly spread, you know? There's, there's not yeah. enough butter on this slice of toast if you get my drift. <laughs> no, for sure. That's why I feel bad for giving these movies this much uh, <laughs> real estate in the slideshow, because it is definitely the worst of the three symbiote stories, mm. I guess the Raimi movies combined uh, as a unit, of what we're talking about, because the animated one's, like, genuinely really good. Yep. And this one is, like, mm -mm. I <laughs> it's trying my, my whole it's thing hard. is like it's it's not that much worse than the other two movies in my mind it's like it's in, it's in the same ship there these are cut from the same cloth through and through it's assembled worse but it's 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 the same components that's really it it is stitched together much more clumsily than the previous movie spider-man 2 yeah. is very tightly paced spider-man 1 does everything it needs to to set things up and and you know establish spider-man and all that like spider-man 1 is corny spider-man 2 is like good enough and honestly let's be real mostly held up by alfred molina the first two movies were good because of the villains spider-man was fine toby Maguire is perfectly serviceable as spider-man he does a good job playing off the villains but Willem Dafoe in the first movie and Alfred Molina in the second were the best parts of their movies. Amazing. And the third yeah. movie did not have a good villain. It had three no. sh villains. Yeah. And they don't get to like Matryoshka together into one good villain. <laughs> it's just three bad ones. It's not, it's not great. No. In conclusion, I am not sorry for liking Spider-Man 3. <laughs> I'm only sorry that we spent so long talking about it. <laughs> yep. <sighs> also, that's not the conclusion. We've got more slides. I can feel them. <laughs> yes. We have one more, which is Spectacular Spider-Man. Yeah. For real, go watch this one. Y'all, it is good as hell. It's so good. This show absolutely rules. <laughs> this is possibly up until this next game coming out. My favorite single interpretation of Spider-Man that exists mm. ever. This is the one. <laughs> <laughs> it handles it just absolutely perfectly. MCU, get out of here. You're not even part of the conversation. <laughs> Spectacular Spider-Man does such a good job. And I'm very excited to talk about my favorite four episodes Me in too. that show. First off, uh, we we begin uh, in season one of only two seasons, tragically, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. where we have the same type of uh, origin that we've gotten in the animated and in the movie where we get it from, you know, Space Rocket kind of thing. Um, it goes to Dr. Connor's lab and then uh, as Spider-Man is trying to investigate it because he wants to see it because he's a science nerd, he right. uh, foils a break-in by Black Cat. Peter accidentally gets the suit on him and realizes later as he's swinging like, oh, hey, what the hell is this? Mm -hmm. But this is an interesting kind of Spider-Man story that we're, we're getting here, even before the symbiote shows up, because we've really seen the toll that these problems of being Spider-Man and Peter Parker take on him. And these responsibilities are a lot. He's got money problems, job problems, curfew problems, friendship problems of disappointing his friends and his co-workers. In the case of the Dr. Connors lab, he gets fired because he's too irresponsible to make it on time and, and be present and, and help in the way that they need. So Spider-Man over these episodes is dealing with these problems as they come and finding solutions by working very carefully through all of them. And in the very first episode, he's like, everything's gonna be great. I'm gonna get a job <laughs> at the Bugle. It's gonna be awesome. And none of his like miracle solutions ever fix any of his problems. It's only by very carefully working on them one at a time that he's able to make things better. Mm -hmm. So what happens then when we get the symbiote in play? Yep. And it is, a very, very cool interpretation of this story. Easily my favorite one of the bunch that we're talking about today. So we have a comfortable, satisfying, absolute downward spiral unfolding <laughs> over these next three episodes. For real, A plus and shitting arc for Peter. His voice slowly gets nastier and his suit goes from a like palette swap to black with the webbing uh -huh. to eventually over the course of the three episodes, a full blackout suit with this huge white spider logo across it and a white spider on the back as well. Yeah. 
And it's just really cool to see that slow progression over the three episodes as the symbiote is taking more and more control. Mm -hmm. You hear his internal monologue change, he gets angrier with his friends, and eventually his thoughts are in the plural we, referring to Parker as an external, uh, separate entity other than himself. Yeah. At the end of the second episode, he's like, Oh, well, well, what does it matter to us? Parker got what he needed, and that's all that matters. Mm. It's like, oh, yeah. sh we, <laughs> oh, sh we spiegeling, bro? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, basically. One thing that I, uh, I that I like about this show is that we kind of have near constant access to Peter's inner monologue. He's almost constantly narrating what's going on with him, what he's worried about, what's stressing him out. Like, it doesn't tend to hit in, like, conversations with other people, but it does you know, hit, which means that when this is happening, we suddenly get like, well, that sounded like Peter, but that that thought sure didn't sound like the Peter yeah. we've gotten to know. Like the fact that they've established from the jump, like, hey, narration is just a thing that happens in this story. We get his inner monologue. We get his thoughts. It's like, great. Okay, awesome. That means that we can have a more direct look into like what exactly is going on in his head than basically any other thing would allow except for like thought balloons on a comic page. The, yeah. the, of course, the telltale sign is that whenever it's the symbiote, it's always we. Whereas yep. good old Peter will be like, what was I doing last night? What the hell happened? And it's like, yeah, what yeah. were you doing? <laughs> so he, he progressively gets a little crappier over time as these episodes go on. And we, we see the... Cleo, stop. Stop huffing all over the microphone. Good <laughs> God, this is your symbiote arc too. <laughs> it's it, it's good stuff. It's a really good interpretation of the character and, and seeing how this downward spiral unfolds over the course of a lot of episodes. But the the highlight sequence mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. uh, this this whole arc is the fight in Central Park. And I almost made a detailed diatribe about just this scene <laughs> like two years ago when we first came up with the show idea. Yep. And I was like, I need to wait on it. I need to figure out like a way to do this and to find my angle. And now I finally have because God, I love this scene. So good. It is a Sinister Six team up. They all break out of, of prison and they first confront uh, Peter in Times Square and they kick his ass. Peter has to run away in fear because they are absolutely overpowering him. It's it's really bad. He just has to book it into the sewers and get away. All the, the tricks that he had done to win uh, against the enemies previously just aren't working. Um, like Doc Ock has a full power source for his arms, so that's not a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. Vulture's backpack is fixed, so Spider-Man can't punch into it. Like all these problems that, that were weapons Spider-Man can use, he just can't anymore. Yeah. And it's bad. While they're having this fight in in Times Square, Aunt May, unbeknownst to Peter, has a heart attack and winds up in the hospital. Peter goes home after this fight to lick his wounds and doesn't realize it. He sets an alarm, uh, like he goes to bed at eight, takes a nap, wakes up at, uh, at nine. Uh, you see Peter's hand hit the alarm and then reach off to the side of the bed and the symbiote like jumps onto him. Peter leans up in the suit and then goes out the window to Central Park where there's reports of like, oh, you know, Sinister Six have taken hostages at such and such bank by Central Park. Mm -hmm. He swings over there, he gets ambushed, he's starting to kind of get on the back foot a little bit, but then he starts to turn the tables. He's using new strategies to fight each of the Sinister Six and pitting them against each other in very clever ways. So he uses Shocker's gauntlets to melt Sandman and he crushes Rhino with Electro, or he, he crushes Electro with Rhino right, yeah. so that Electro can't get out, but also Rhino's constantly being electrocuted. So he's able to take out the various members of the Sinister Six by using them against each other in various ways. He takes the little the little little shoe kicky stabby guys off of Vulture's uh, boots and throws them at Shocker's gauntlets to break them. He's doing all this really complicated stuff against six hugely intimidating enemies. Yeah. And then he almost, at the end of the fight, he almost impales Doc Ock before Captain Stacy is like, ah, oh, hold it. And then eventually Spider-Man just like runs away and the fight's over. Mm -hmm. But this whole scene, the choreography is really, really cool. There's this really fascinating balance of Peter being on the ropes and then turning it around and getting out of scrapes. He's, he's almost in trouble a lot several times throughout this fight. And of course, for anyone who's been to Central Park, the, the geography is completely on point. Everything is very consciously staged within the real physical space of New York. And yep. the whole show does this fantastically. There's so many scenes that are like, that's just an actual place in New York yeah. that I recognize and have been to, which is super, super cool. Painstakingly drawn rather than taking photos yeah. and filtering them like some shows do, which is complete yeah, exactly. We can always tell. Um. Yeah. 
But critically, this whole fight with all this, like, really complicated choreography that's going on, some members of the Sinister Six remark that Spider-Man is not quipping. Doc <laughs> Ock thinks like, oh, yeah, you're, you're in peril, you're on the ropes, you're not cracking wise now, are you? But this whole fight, Spider-Man is totally silent, and that is indescribably eerie to watch. Yeah, yeah, it's weird. Like, you don't even get, like, effort noises. Like, I th he, he no. like his arm gets slashed at one point, and, like, he visibly reacts, but he doesn't make a sound. It's really no. weird. Uh, there's also yeah. a couple other subtle things in the fight choreography. There's one bit where I think Doc Ock, like, has all four of his limbs, like, grabbed and is like, ah, now I'm going to yada yada. And he, like, shoots, like, web out of, like, the sides of his suit. And yeah, gets the little to, web underarm thingies. Yeah, he yeah, shoots from there. Yeah, and gets Doc Ock's eyes, and it's like, hmm, that's not a thing that Peter usually can can do or would think of. How interesting. Yeah, yeah it's not his usual combat style. No. It's, it's very different. So, hmm, hmm, how curious is this? <laughs> and the next morning, Peter wakes up, he's like, oh man, I've been asleep for nine hours? The dude was asleep. <laughs> he gets the paper and realizes that Spider-Man fought the Sinister Six and won and took photographs in his sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and presumably sent them to the bugle. <laughs> Yeah! The idea of, like, the, the symbiote just, like, puppeting Peter around, like, oh, I've seen him do this, I've seen him do that. Like, it's kind of endearing if it weren't making him worse. Yeah. So, this is horrifying, obviously. Yeah. And it's a very clever way to do what the other two stories that we've seen fundamentally do the very first thing, which is Peter is asleep and he wakes up with the symbiote suit on somewhere else hanging off the side of a building. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like, oh, whoa, where am I? But to have this whole sequence where at first Peter's always been conscious with the suit and then he has this moment where the best he's ever fought he was asleep and the symbiote was just on cruise control. Kill mode cruise control, essentially. <laughs> Instant kill mode. really, really effective and very unsettling yeah. in a way that points to the original comic run where Spider-Man has this, like, the suit's taking him out on a joyride in the middle of the night and Peter's like, oh gosh, like, what happened to me? So I really like how the show is willing to play with not only the most, like, obvious antecedents in the 90s animated cartoon and the Raimi movies, mm -hmm. but going back to the original comic and taking elements from that that worked better in that comic, namely the suit taking him out for a joyride, and bringing that into their version of stories, where they're, like, they're taking a little bit of everything to put it together, which is part of why I like it as my favorite Spider-Man, because it just draws on everything. Everything that you like from all of your favorite Spider-Man stories are in here somehow, including Spider-Man doing crime fighting when he's asleep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot that I think is very cool about this. One interesting like bit of subtext is kind of like, so wait, is Peter like holding back a lot of the time? Like nothing the symbiote did was completely outside his abilities except for the aforementioned like armpit web slinging. Uh, but like, is, you know, traditionally there's kind of this thing about Spider-Man where it's like, you got to watch out when he stops quipping because that means he's 100% concentrating on kicking your ass. Um, yeah. And there, there's implications of that in the show. We do see him get serious sometimes, but in this case it's like, oh, wow, yeah, Spider-Man had the ability to stop the Sinister Six. He just didn't have it in him before, but he does when the, when the symbiote's using him. So is the symbiote better at being Spider-Man than Peter is? That's... Hmm, not the best yeah. implication for what that might mean. <laughs> Good Venom setup, yeah, oddly enough. Yeah, <laughs> it is. That's the thing, because, like, this is yeah. already planting the idea. Like, we knew, oh, he's stronger, he's faster, he doesn't need to make web fluid anymore, that's great. But, like, this is the kind of thing where it's like, oh, wait, hold on, the symbiote is sentient and has been paying attention and is yeah. better at being Spider-Man than Peter is on much less practice. This thing yeah. is dangerous. And it's like, yep. right now it's the implication of like, oh, oh, good thing it's on my side, but it's like, hmm, how long is that <laughs> going to be true, bud? Yeah. 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 As he, he gets the paper, he's like, oh my God, what's this? This is the first moment where he starts to refer to himself as, as we, mm. where it's like, oh my God, like, what did we do last night? Oh, this is crazy. And then you hear a different internal monologue with, uh, with Peter's voice being in a lower register, like, oh, come on, we got what we wanted, didn't we? We put down the Sinister Six hard, and Peter, and, and Parker got the money from the photos. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it all works out. Like, what are we worrying about? So it tells Peter to quit whining, <laughs> and then it, it's, it's bad. It's bad, gang. This is also <laughs> just a very solid and simple way to kind of 
tell us what the symbiote is actually doing to Peter in his mm -hmm. head. Because, of course, in the movie, we kind of have to infer, like, the symbiote's making him a dick. But in this case, it's like, the symbiote is putting thoughts in his head. It's like, yeah. it can puppet his body around, but it doesn't seem like it has to most of the time because it can just be like, no, it's fine. Why would I Why would I need to put the symbiote back? It's so useful and great and handsome, and I heard it has an eight pack. <laughs> like, and that's what that's what it said in, in the first episode exactly. when he's about to confess to Captain Stacy, like, oh, by the way, I accidentally stole the alien and then in his with with that nastier monologue it's it's still first person singular mm -hmm. but it's like what are what 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 am i doing like i need to hold on to this to uh to help people <laughs> yeah. yeah and then he like he it. just like brushes off captain stacy and it's fine yeah. so and yeah. in terms of like different ways that stories have represented forms of like mind control and influence and brainwashing and stuff like that this is a pretty like devious one because it's like it's not, I mean, it, it can clearly puppet Peter's body around when he's asleep, but like it has, it can't like force him to do anything yet, exactly. Mm -hmm. But the main way that it's influencing him is just talking in his head with his voice. It's like, yeah. well, this is fine, actually. He's like, oh, I guess this is fine. I, I thought it was fine, so I guess it's fine. And it's like, whoa, buddy, yep. whoa. <laughs> Man, let the intrusive thoughts win. <laughs> yeah, but this, but this is also kind of the symbiote showing its ass because this is the first time it's demonstrated like, oh, this thing... It's, it's not just a very useful tool. It has a consciousness that's capable yeah. of like being tactical and planning and it doesn't act like Peter does. Like this isn't just, no. oh, his, sub his subconscious, he went and fought in his sleep because he wanted to. It's like, no, something else did that. So uh, at the same time that it has to crank up the like, no, no, we're fine. It's cool, shush, 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 don't worry about it. Like it's, he already knows like, okay, so the suit like has a mind of its own, that's, Okay, I guess. I guess I'm okay with that. <laughs> He's like, oh, well, yeah. for how long, Buster Brown? Uh, the next episode sees the consequences of that, where he starts going really off the rails. Um, he <laughs> starts a downward spiral. He's lashing out at all of his friends, where at the beginning of the next episode, they're like, hey, Peter, your Aunt May's in the hospital. Is she all right? He's like, I don't need any of your sympathy. What are you going to do? Pay my, my aunt's hospital bills? Get out of here. And then he, like, he runs off. Mm -hmm. He goes to Tombstone to ask for, like, the, the crime money to help with Aunt May's medical bills. To specify, Tombstone had previously offered to pay him off to not stop certain low-level crimes that Tombstone was profiting yeah. from. And of course, good old classic Spidey was like, no way, man, you're a criminal. I'm going to take you down. And then Black Suit Spider-Man was like, so what was that about money? And it's like, oh, well, hold on. <laughs> whoa, whoa, yeah. whoa. Peter, your principles. Yeah, yeah. And, and even at the very beginning of the symbiote sequence, he's working with Black Cat, and she's like, oh, come on, you sure you don't want to do crime? And Peter's like, with the black suit, like, no, obviously not. And then here, two episodes later, he's like, oh, I can do a little crime. As a treat. For me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a self-care exactly. day. This is my yeah. cheat day when I'm allowed to do crimes. <laughs> Exactly. So so then there, there's not the specific moment of like his absolute lowest single action that makes him be like, holy crap, I got to get out of here. Um, of course, with the original cartoon, you had autopilot almost killing Shocker mm -hmm. uh, with Spider-Man 3. You had when he hits Mary Jane. With this one, it's it's a little wibbly. He gets like chewed out by Flash, who's like, hey, man, like, what the hell are you doing, Parker? Like, you've got... You got responsibilities, like your friends are trying to help you. Like, why are you being such a dick? Like, I know something about being a dick and you're doing that. Like, don't. I'm the flattest bully character written since Dash from Danny Phantom. <laughs> yeah. But so this is kind of the moment where Peter's like, okay, this is bad. It's kind of the accumulated actions of like replaying in his head. Okay, I've been lashing out. Mm -hmm. I'm turning to Tombstone for money. That's horrible. And if Flash is talking sense into me, okay, something's bad. I feel like they kind of wanted to keep this Peter a little bit 100% redeemable. Like nothing he does is like, that's gonna haunt him forever. Like he doesn't, he doesn't kill anyone. He doesn't do anything he can't undo. He's not at fault for Aunt May's heart attack. Uh, there was nothing he could have done if he'd known about it sooner. Like basically this version of Peter does not have to deal with like, oh, I like severely fucked up. He just is a dick to his friends and kicks the Sinister Six's ass a little extra hard, which is, yeah. Frankly speaking, one of the coolest scenes in the show. So, like, we're not oh, that yeah. mad at him for it. 
So essentially, unlike Spider-Man 3 and in the 1990-something Spider-Man show, this Peter is basically like enough of a like good boy that he catches it early. He's like, hold on, yeah. before I do anything unforgivable, let's stop this. So this is essentially like what happens when Peter has the, you know, get your right and you fix this damn door in Spider-Man 3. And that first rejection of the symbiote mm -hmm. is like, oh, oh, hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm about to cross a line. That's, er, he killed Sandman, whatever. He thought he killed Sandman. <laughs> Sandman wasn't this dead. This is kind of Peter's, yeah, this is kind of Peter's moment of like, okay, I gotta get this off me. So he goes to the bell tower and I really like how consciously and lovingly this episode recreated very specific scenes and sequences from the Raimi movie, Spider-Man mm -hmm. 1 and 3 in particular, yeah. where he has this shot, you know, in the, the church tower and he, he hits the bell and then like the mask of the symbiote like jumps off his face, just like in Spider-Man 3, like that's really cool. Mm -hmm. But then it fights back, it's like, oh, you can't do this to me, no, no, no. So it cocoons him up and then brings him into a battle of the center of the mind where he's fighting with this like personification of the symbiote and Uncle Ben is there and they are kind of like the angel and devil on his shoulder going through his whole origin story where the symbiote is trying to convince Peter, like, look, everything's gone wrong for you. Everyone lets you down somehow. Like the world's out to get you. Like this is unfair, but like I'm the the only one who really cares about you, yeah. Spider-Man, you know? And then Uncle Ben is like, no, you're, you're a good kid. Like, look at everything that you've done. Look at all the people you've saved. Look at all your friends. All these things that are, are so, like, good about what has happened to you since becoming Spider-Man. They do a lot of really interesting things with replaying the like the wrestling sequence from Spider-Man 1, the whole thing mm -hmm. with the library and the wrestling ring, which is, as far as I'm aware, that version of the origin only appears in Spider-Man 1. They they do the whole thing with like running down the hallway with the crook who steals the money from the wrestling guy after Peter gets stiffed on his paycheck. Yep. And then that's the guy who kills Uncle Ben. And then they specifically have this big battle in this like abandoned warehouse. In this version, instead of the guy tripping and falling to his death, he trips and falls out the window, but then Spider-Man like shoots the web down and catches him and leaves him for the cops. And this mm. is the one distinct aspect of his origin story that's different from in Spider-Man 1. And as this moment's about to happen, the symbiote's like, yes, take your revenge. And Ben's like, no, 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 look at what he does. Yeah. And Spider-Man does the good thing of, of saving the guy, even though he killed Uncle Ben and he has every reason to let him fall, Spider-Man still saves him because that's what Spider-Man do. <laughs> so this is really cool moment of this battle in the center of the mind where he's, he's kind of redeemed by the memory of Uncle Ben and this great power, great responsibility speech that kind of puts everything back into perspective to reframe his origin story within the context of the symbiote and assert like, no, I have great power. I have this great responsibility. I can't be like all up on my own glory and think that I'm the center of the universe. There are other people who exist who I have to take care of. And they in turn take care of me, yep. which is what the symbiote says. Is like, you don't need to take care of these losers. They haven't done anything for you. Peter's like, no, <laughs> actually you're wrong on both of those counts. So it's a really, really great scene. And then as the uh, symbiote, you know, kind of falls off of him, he you know, webs it up, takes it back to the Connors lab, puts it in this little chamber and cranks the, uh, the freeze on it to try to kill it. Mm -hmm. And as he's there, Eddie is like, what the hell are you doing? Like, the, I'm gonna lose my, my job at this company because the Connors, or I lose my job at this lab because the Connors are losing their grant money because they don't have the symbiote. How can you take this from me? You're taking away my livelihood by destroying this 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 alien that we were supposed to be studying. Mm -hmm. So he, of course, has all these awful, angry emotions about Spider-Man, and the symbiote like starts to feed on it, breaks out of being frozen, grabs onto him, and then we get the Venom episode, which is its own fun thing. We're not really going to get into it here. Um, yeah. It's it's not quite as compelling as the chase sequence from uh, the first Spider-Man cartoon, but it is it is a good episode that shows how scary Venom can be because he knows all of Peter's secrets. He's basically just going around and like systematically terrorizing everyone Peter knows mm -hmm. instead of directly chasing him Peter has to catch all the falling plates uh, yeah. in, in this next episode I will say that the absolute funniest thing about that is that when Venom like ambushes him the first time to basically just give him the, his, his ultimatum of like I'm gonna f*** you and you love he, he's like you know who you love the most and then runs off and Peter's like oh no he's gonna go after MJ and it's like no he's <laughs> he not but he's, he's not going after MJ this time <laughs> And yeah. it's just so fun that, like, the symbiote, like, read his whole ass top to bottom and was like, ah, Gwen Stacy, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and just yeah. off. And it takes Peter so long to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, it's it's a good sequence. And then, of course, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Red, he does the like, oh, symbiote, take me back instead. Mm -hmm. And the symbiote is like, oh, hell yeah. Then it goes back over to Peter. They have another little battle in the center of the mind. It's framed differently. It's actually in color this time and with like a red background to show that like Spider-Man's in control. Mm -hmm. And the symbiote's like, oh, there are no negative emotions here. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> and Peter's like, gotcha, bitch. Uh, and then the symbiote just kind of slinks off. And then he puts it in the bag, buries it in concrete, and then that's the end of that. For another uh, season. Uh, until, or so. of course, Venom shows back up yeah. in, in a season. Yeah. So it's it's a good ass four part episode, and easily my favorite part of my favorite piece of, of Spider Man media. It really gets to the heart of what I love about the symbiote stories because it shows the worst version of a good person mm -hmm. and how a good person will reject that. Even when they come to that point of like staring at the abyss, they've done their worst, they've, you know, they've alienated their friends, they've put themselves first, they've become angry, violent, and all this stuff. But then, because, you know, Peter Parker is a good person, he will, even after losing every last, you know, shred of diplomacy and patience and forgiveness, and it's all replaced by anger, he will reassert his balance of power and responsibility, do the responsible thing, cast it off, and then prove that he is, in fact, a better Spider-Man without it, mm -hmm. and come back from this lowest point of his. It's it's Spider-Man's go-to Dark Knight of the Soul arc <laughs> to reaffirm, like, this is what the core of this character is about. He just got to nasty him up a little bit first, but then he comes out of it better than before. So it's why I love it so much. Yeah, it's one of the most interesting ways you can do a standard, like, hero's journey, belly of the whale thing, because normally that's like, okay, we take mm -hmm. the character, we push them to their breaking point. We put them in some kind of horrible situation. And in this case, the horrible situation is kind of a honey trap. Uh, it's <laughs> Spider-Man lifts the heavy thing is the standard belly of the whale model. It's like, oh no, he's in a very bad situation. He must plumb his heart for depths of courage and strength never before tapped. Whereas this is more like, wouldn't it be so much easier if you just stuck with this thing? You got a power up yeah. from it and it was nice and chill. It's not even that bad, you know? It does, it does, it's not like mind controlling him. It's not brainwashing him. It's not forcing him to do anything he doesn't want want to do until he starts pushing back um and it's this kind of very subtle like insinuation and I, I don't know if you have a slide about this but i remember we talked about this when the first like i think gameplay clip of uh insomniac games spider-man playstation 5 sony's marvels sony's insomniac marvels. spider man yes. 2 for uh, ps5 so, 2023 exactly yeah that's <laughs> the one uh where we were because of course it was clipped of uh it was from the perspective of miles morales but we were following black box and peter parker i like that he sounds angry and stressed like he doesn't yeah. he's not stressed he's not being mean to miles it just sounds like he's at the absolute end of his rope and he's really worried and yeah. that's what i like because like there's a lot of cases with you know black suit spider-man it's like okay he's being so like mean that i i like it's good that his friends are calling him out like dude that's not like you but i feel like he should kind of be on the inside like wow i just crossed the line saying that i shouldn't have said that and so i like that what we've seen of black suit peter in the um sony's marvels insomniac games is ps5 <laughs> spider-man 2 coming 2023 uh is that like this is a believable way that I could see a character like Peter Parker take the kinds of actions we see him take when he's, yeah. you know, when he's symbioted is like, okay, you take this good person with seemingly endless reserves of patience and kindness for a world that always assumes the worst of him and never rewards his good intentions. How can I make this man act unwise and it's like <laughs> <laughs> step one black cat step two uh um, <laughs> the the thing that i believe that would that would do this is okay strip away that patience you can yeah. make him tired enough and stressed enough and angry enough to lose that buffer of kindness that has been shielding the world from his inner turmoil that we know exists because a lot of the time we have the privilege of his internal monologue because the thing is like peter gets the short end of the stick so many times. The world yeah. is cruel to Spider-Man. This is like the one trait that he has across almost every writer. The world is cruel to him, and the reason why he continues to protect it is because he is kind and patient to a fault. But those are not completely, those are, those are depths that cannot be plumbed forever. And like, in a lot of stories, it's like, okay, Peter's going through it and he's not sure if he can keep going, but he can. And in this case, it's like, hey, what if we just zero out that bar? What if he has no <laughs> patience? What if he he has to make the, the 
the choice to be kind and forgiving and to pull his punches. What if we drain the pool that he draws from to do all of those things? What if we take away all of his spoons and then we make him fight crime <laughs> anyway? And yeah. the result that- All forks and no spoons make Spider-Man an edgelord. <laughs> exactly. And the thing is, I think that, because we haven't seen the game yet, I think that this has the potential to be the version of Black Suit Spider-Man that I find the most believable because- the Same. Way, yeah, because because the way they did it in Spectacular Spider-Man, currently, I agree, it's my favorite version. But I think the reason why I like it is because we get an answer, how is the symbiote doing this to him? And it's like, it's literally infiltrating his thoughts. It's, it's saying things in his head that he thinks he's thinking to himself. That is a very believable, surreptitious, specfic way to manipulate somebody's actions and, you know, and tendencies. And like, we're in his head enough to know, like, he's not just being a dick, he's not being cruel, like, he doesn't ch he doesn't chicken on Enmei because he's trying to be nice. He's like, she must be exhausted after last night, I don't want to wake her up, uh, I'm sure she's fine, he has no reason to suspect otherwise. It works because we're like, okay, I can see why he's acting this way, but then there are things where I'm like, I don't really buy that. It's like, okay, he needs money for Aunt May's hospital bills, I don't think his first move would have been to go to Tombstone, that feels like a no. symbiote move. Like, that's the kind of thing where it's supposed to show, like, how how much it's affecting him. But pretty much any time a story reaches the point of, like, okay, this thing has gone from encouraging a character's bad impulses to, like, this thing is doing things that that character would never do. It's like, okay, that character is no longer responsible for what they're doing. They are being controlled. Like, that's, it's not a thing that can happen in real life. It's not a moral quandary that has a real solution. It's just like, okay, that that's no longer the character, functionally speaking. That's somebody else yeah. meat puppeting them around. You know, the version in Spider-Man 3, it's like, okay, this Peter is a dork and he's spiteful and he's been through the ringer. I believe that he would lash out to an extent and god damn it, I can't be defending the writing of Spider-Man 3. What have you done to me, dude? <laughs> um, but the It's almost as if I'm a corrupting influence in your psyche, Red. No! <laughs> but the, 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 hold on, let me find a bell to punch. But like, the, the thing is, he's like... <laughs> We spend the whole first movie being like, man, Peter's got it rough, but now he's Spider-Man. And then we spend the whole second movie being like, wow, Peter being Spider-Man is not helping and everyone's so mean to him. And then like Spider-Man 3, it's like things are going okay for Spider-Man, but things are not going well for Peter Parker and people are still being mean to him. And then when he, you know, when he gets his little, aren't you tired of being nice, don't you want to go ape <laughs> arc? It's like... <laughs> To an extent, this is catharsis for the audience. I have wanted Peter to stand up for himself and he seemed pathologically incapable of doing it for the last two and a half movies. I get it. And then he immediately pushes it way over the edge and it's like, well, I'm yeah. not rooting for you anymore, dude. You, you, you yeah. passed the point where I was like, yeah, this is kind of satisfying to watch. Uh, and I have not seen the, the 90s version, but it definitely seems like they play a lot more into like the symbiote just kind of starts like you know, assuming direct control, taking executive action without Peter's say-so, and makes it much more clearly like kind of a possessing force. So I'm excited for a new interpretation that actually seems like potentially the first Black Suit Spider-Man arc I've ever seen that does not at any point break or override Peter's character. Um, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. What I like about the idea of the symbiote story is that it, it is cathartic in the way of like, it's just you get to see Peter just frack everything up yeah. and just like take a hammer to all the troubles that that ail him in life or sometimes a grenade to his best friend's face. Hey, in, the, in his some best situations. friend threw the grenade. That one wasn't as on him as people say. But Peter, throw it back. Um, <laughs> but it's, it, it's, it's compelling in the way to see like, what is the worst thing that Peter can do? Because I don't believe in like the, oh, you know, one bad day, like that's bullshit. Yeah. But what I like about the symbiote story, it is, the the outline of the one bad day theme except the point of the story is that peter always gets down to his lowest point takes accountability and comes back mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. he's a better spider-man afterwards where he always stares his own darkness dead in the face sometimes with a very thematic uh and expertly artistically crafted battle <laughs> in the center of the mind and he comes back and becomes the the best version of himself again and what I like about that is that all of us have a kind of darkness in us, the impulse to do the sh thing because mm -hmm. it's easier and it makes us feel good. And the symbiote story reminds us that we can always choose to be kind, to be forgiving, to be patient, and to be the best versions of ourselves. And Spider-Man 3, the, the whole thing that all the characters do is make very hard choices that sometimes come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Granted, yep, granted, yep, granted. Yep. But 
the, the whole premise is that it's all about the choices that we make, and it's what I think defines the symbiote story, is that Peter chooses to give in and do the things that are bad because they feel good for him, but then he has to make the choice to throw all that away and be the hero that he needs to be and the friend that he needs to be, both as Spider-Man and as Peter. Yeah. It's just, it's compelling. It's good-ass storytelling. QED, look at this edgelord. I love him so goddamn much. Yeah. I feel like there's there's something very interesting about the specifically the element of Peter comes back from the brink and then has to do some work to like make up for the damage that he's done. Yeah. Um, because of course, especially in the world of superheroes, black and white morality is extremely common. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, you know, black and white morality, black and white venom suit. For a story featuring a black and white suit, it's definitely got more shades of gray than we're accustomed to. But uh, <laughs> but the thing is like. It's so common for it to, and I've, I've done this when I've, you know, done trope talks where it's like, this is what happens when you have a hero that falls to be a villain or like a, a villain that gets redeemed into being a hero or like, this is why a character would change sides. And it's like, this is a very simple framing. A lot of stories use the simple framing. Superhero comics use this simple framing. There are super villains and superheroes and they are on opposite sides. And anytime that you have conflict outside of those boundaries, it's usually something contrived and stupid. Like, oh no, Wolverine has to fight the Hulk because of a big misunderstanding and also how cool would that be if Wolverine fought yeah. that um, <laughs> And then you get something like this where it's like Peter Parker is one of the most human superheroes. He's got like human problems. Yeah. And anytime they try and take him out of the range of relatable high school to college student, uh, they put him right back in. They, they time jump him or they, they reset him or they one more day him and they're basically like, no, you have to get back in there and continue to be relatable to the YA demographic. <laughs> and he's got like normal human problems. He's very much a case where where Spider-Man is the the persona he he puts on to do his job, to do his responsibility, but the real person he is is Peter Parker. And unlike similar superhero Superman, who is of course the mask that Clark Kent wears, uh, Peter Parker's home life sucks. Uh, Again, yeah. the world hates Peter Parker. Everything goes wrong for him. He's always broke. He's always miserable. Sometimes he gets to have a girlfriend for more than a couple arcs before another writer changes and kills them or makes them break up or one more days it or whatever. He really feels like a person in a way that a lot of superheroes kind of don't. They get to feel larger than life. Spider-Man doesn't. It's like a rare treat yeah. to see Spider-Man really kick ass in a in a like really larger than life context. He's friendly neighborhood. He does street level stuff. And that means that when we see him go dark edgelord it's like oh i could be this guy like i if i were enough of an asshole and if i'd had enough of a bad day and if i had superpowers i might do similar things uh mm -hmm. and that's why i think it's kind of interesting that in this version he always you know he, he gives up the suit he tries to make amends for what he did and then he always strives to be better because that means that we're not falling for the binary moral you're either a good guy or a bad guy. It's like, oh, Spider-Man yeah. is a good guy. He puts on the black suit and becomes a bad guy, but then he takes it off again and becomes a good guy again. It's like, that's really not what this is. Spider-Man is a person who <laughs> up on several occasions. And then in this case, he gets an alien symbiote that hops him up a little bit. And then he <laughs> up a lot more than average while he's wearing it. And then he's like, oh, I have a problem. <laughs> Let me fix the problem and then see about fixing all the stuff I just <laughs> up. Yeah. The interesting thing is that then you get Venom, the specter of his past mistakes literally haunting him. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I also have to fix that. Yeah. There's slightly more consequences to my <laughs> up than I thought, but that's okay. I'll deal with it. And in a space as basic as there are superheroes and supervillains, they are diametrically opposed. Superheroes do good, supervillains do bad. It is very rare for them to cross those boundaries. It's kind of cool to just have this be such a, a core part of the character. Like the, one of the most iconic good guys had a really, really bad week with some minor influence of uh, an <laughs> alien, not even really mind controlling him, just making him his worst self. And now he's not doing that anymore. He makes the choice to to make up for it and, and be better mm -hmm. going forward. All this to say, uh, my favorite story archetype from my favorite superhero and why I am so excited to play this new Spider-Man game. Yeah. Uh, if you're in the future, sound off about how good this game is. Yeah, we're all so <laughs> excited for Sony's Marvel's Insomniac Games' is Spider-Man 2 Electric Boogaloo PS5 Edition 60 FPS uh, glitchless. <laughs>
any percent. <laughs> Bell percent is how fast. I, please tell me that's a, please, people from the future, tell me that is a speed run where you have to go through the game as fast as possible, hit yourself against the bell, and that's time on the speed run. <laughs> Show us bell percent. Give us bell percent. <laughs> <laughs> but until then, uh, uh, bye. bye.